thanks so much. Thank you for coming, and I really want to thank um, huge thanks to Formation's team for putting this together so quickly. I think only in India it's possible to, you know, send an email, say I'm coming, and then someone actually put an event together. Only in Big Only in Big And I also have to say, um, I'm, you know, we were sorry that uh, Formation didn't join the PhD program at NYU, but I have to say Bombay is definitely um, probably it's. Much better for Bombay that he didn't, or Mumbai, sorry, that he didn't, because otherwise you wouldn't have this amazing space, or you would have to wait you know, for much longer, because right now he'd be sitting there in a snowstorm writing his dissertation. So it's like, you know, I think now the whole city is grateful, and I'm so happy that you know, this is an amazing space. I got a chance to um, tour and see all the like, cool things that have happened, and so it's really exciting to be here. Um, I just want to, so I just, just mentioned, I'm just going to have these slides running on a loop. Uh, and these are all uh, these are all photos that I've taken uh, over the years um, to, of my research. As you can get get a sense, I mean, all of my work has really been about behind the scenes rather than you know in the front of what's on the screen. Although some of these uh, pictures are also in the book, but your the publisher never allows you to put as many photos as you want in a book because um, it makes it too expensive. So there's more pictures up here than there are in the book. So just to, just to kind of you get a sense of. Um, the kind of work that I've done. And I just want to mention quickly, even though the book is called Producing Bollywood, um, and there's a specific reason why it's called that, and what I mean by the term Bollywood is like, I never actually think of Bollywood as synonymous with um, Indian cinema, or synonymous with Hindi cinema, or not even, or with the idea of the Indian film industry. When I use the word Bollywood, I use, really use it to mean a very particular moment in Hindi filmmaking. Um, and a really particular moment in the film industry's history, which really refers to a transformation in its uh, filmmaking practices, as well as the way it uh, changes in the way it thinks about audiences. So when I, so the book really is very much about how this industry has become this entity that we now refer to as Bollywood, unfortunately too often indiscriminately. Um, and a little just context and background, I worked on this book for 15 years, so it's taken longer than most Hindi movies have taken. That's why I always like to tell my uh, filmmaker or informants that, you know, the one thing that takes longer than making a Hindi movie is probably writing an academic book. Um, I guess maybe the only, I guess Pakistan beats me up, right? Pakistan took 17 years to make, but, you know, so my book took 15 years uh, uh, to kind of come into being, uh, which is just a little less than the combined ages of my two children. At one point, it was actually more than their ages, but, you know, they, they keep growing, right? So uh, now it's a little bit less than their combined ages. Um, I'm a cultural anthropologist, which often in India people don't necessarily know what that means. It's really like what here people refer to as a sociologist. Um, and so I've been uh, conducting research about the Hindi film industry since 1996. I lived in Bombay in 1996 for a year doing field work for my PhD dissertation. And then I did a subsequent field work. I've come to Bombay for shorter visits, so I came uh, in 2000, in 2005, in 2006. Um, and I've also observed Hindi film shoots in the US over the last uh, decade. And you'll know, well, this, for example, this was in Philadelphia. In anthropology, our main research method is what we call uh, participant observation, which means that basically we derive all of our information about a particular community or society or group from immersing ourselves in that world um, and observing and inter interacting. Uh, with people within it. So for my research, I immersed myself in the world of the film industry. So I spent a lot of time on film sets, filmmakers' offices, editing studios, dubbing studios, outdoor shoots, other types of production. Um, in fact, after a while, people didn't quite know what to do with me because they kept thinking, I should not be, you know, people kept saying, aren't you going home? When are you going to, you know? And after a while, when I was getting ready to go back home, they said, why are you leaving now, right? Because so, they just assumed, I guess because it is a kind of, into the world at one point, like, well, if you spent, if I spent so much time that they, everyone assumed I would stop writing anything and just like start making films, but that didn't happen. Um, I also carried out um, about about a hundred or like a kind of a formal interviews, right, with about a hundred like kind of formal meeting, like sit down, tape recorded um, interviews with about a hundred people in the industry over the last many years. But it's also that all of this kind of daily conversations and interactions that I had with industry members that play actually a really central role in my analysis of the film industry. So the book is actually really a book about filmmakers than it is about films. Although the films are there, but really more as, 
as these um, kind of objects that come to have meaning because of filmmakers' discussions and interpretations, right? So it's really about filmmakers and their processes of filmmaking rather than any kind of in-depth analysis of films. So I just want to give you a sense of the book by reading some excerpts from the introduction and then uh, probably just a small excerpt from one of the chapters. So you kind of get a sense of what it's like. And, um, because objects are always so weird. So this is actually the American edition of the book. But this is the book. It doesn't look like this in India. But um, I took this photo and I thought it was pretty. So this, I, I, I like this cover better. Um, so I'm just going to read a little bit from the introduction. So it's kind of a modified version of the introduction. All right. So this is actually from the book. Yeah, I think this question's a little too late now, because it'll change, I think, by the time your book comes out. I was interviewing Shah Rukh Khan for my dissertation research in 1996. We were at Mehboob Studios, located in Bandra, where Khan was shooting for the film Duplicate. And my first question was about the condescension and distaste expressed toward popular Hindi cinema by Indian elites and the English language media. Khan continued, quote, I believe this attitude will change, and I can say that with a lot of conviction because I would also blame myself for being in that category, say, four or five years ago. I would also think it was not fashionable to like Hindi films." End quote. Little did I realize that, at the time, how prescient his statements would be. Though my book took much longer than Khan would have ever anticipated, he was absolutely right in his predictions about the transformation of attitudes toward popular Hindi cinema, from contempt to celebration, with Khan himself being an important figure in these changes. Hailed by his biographer as, quote, the face of a glittering new India, and, quote, a modern-day god, this is from Anupama Chopra's biography one, Khan's celebrity has extended globally across a variety of domains, from the financial, being the first Indian actor to ring the opening bell of the Nasdaq Stock Exchange in February 2010, to the scholarly, being the subject of an international conference, Shah Rukh Khan in Global Bollywood, held at the University of Vienna in October 2010. That Khan represents a glittering new India is indicative of the other transformation that's taken place over the course of my research. The change in global representations and perceptions of India, from a quote third world country to quote the next great economic superpower. The Hindi film industry, now better known as Bollywood, has been an important symbol of India's makeover in the global arena, one that's deployed by the Indian state and corporate sector in their efforts to brand the country as an economic powerhouse in arenas such as the annual World Economic Forum, held at Davos, Switzerland. Bollywood occupies a presence at Davos mainly through its music and stars. In 2009, Amitabh Bachchan was awarded the World Economic Forum's Crystal Award for Outstanding Excellence, field, excellence in the Field of Culture. Bachchan reflected about the honor on his blog. So this is a long quote from his blog. I took pride in the fact that an honor such as the Crystal Award was bestowed on me, an Indian from the world of escapist commercial cinema, a cinema which 50, 60 years ago was not such a bright profession to be in. Children from good homes were not encouraged to go anywhere near it, an activity that was considered infra dig. But look how this very escapist cinema had progressed through the years, where today in an international forum of some eminence, I was able to stand and represent my fraternity and my country in a most humbling recognition." End quote. So my book is an examination of the very narrative of progress, respectability, and arrival to which Bachchan alludes, alludes in his remarks. It's the story of how the Hindi film industry became Bollywood, a globally recognized and circulating brand of filmmaking from India, which is often posited by the international media as the only serious contender to Hollywood, in terms of global popularity and influence. As an anthropologist, my central focus is the social world of Hindi filmmakers, their filmmaking practices, and their ideologies of production. My book examines the changes in the world of Hindi film production between 1996 to 2010, especially those related to the cultural and social status of films and filmmakers, and the political economy of filmmaking. I locate these changes in Hindi filmmakers' own efforts to garner social respectability and professional prestige. These efforts were enabled by the economic liberalization policies initiated by the Indian government in 1991, which resulted in a dramatically altered media landscape, marked first by the entry of satellite television and then by the emergence of the multiplex theater. I argued that the Hindi film industry's metamorphosis into Bollywood would not have been possible without these developments. When I first began my research about the Hindi film industry nearly two decades ago, the dominant image about mainstream Hindi cinema, generated by Indian political, intellectual, social, and media elites, was that it was an intellectually vacuous, aesthetically deficient, 
and culturally in inauthentic form. Although the images, sounds, and styles of Hindi cinema had been a ubiquitous part of the urban landscape in India for decades, especially in northern India, um, popular Hindi films were frequently criticized or dismissed as, quote, an escape for the masses in the mainstream press, government documents, and well-appointed elite drawing rooms. For example, just about 10 days before my interview with Shah Rukh Khan, during a dinner party hosted by my upstairs neighbor, I was living in Bangladesh at the time, one of her friends launched into a diatribe about the absurdity of Hindi cinema when I was introduced to someone studying the film industry for my PhD. So he exclaimed, what is there to study? All they do is run around trees. I mean, how is it possible that such bad films get made? I don't understand how people can stand to watch them. And what does it say about the mentality of the common Indian that he likes such nonsense? End quote. So even those who were more sympathetic to my research, like journalists and others working within the media world of Bombay, expressed their scorn for the film world by asserting that it should only meet the handful of people, according to them, in the industry with the requisite intelligence and education to understand my project and therefore would be able to help me. If I had paid attention to them, I would only have met like five people. Um, <laughs> now, of course, in 2014, those disdainful attitudes that questioned my research belong to another era. One of the most notable changes since the onset of the millennium, which Shah Rukh Khan had predicted, is the way the Hindi film industry, Hindi cinema and the film industry more broadly, have acquired greater cultural legitimacy from the perspective of the government, the English language media, and English educated speaking elites in India. Hindi cinema and Bombay filmmakers are circulating and being celebrated in a variety of high status sites, from prestigious international film festivals like Cannes in Toronto to elite academic institutions such as Harvard and Cambridge. This enhanced status of Hindi cinema arises from an interconnected set of processes. The increasing <coughs> academic interest and study of popular Hindi cinema by scholars located or trained in North American Britain, the avid consumption of these films by the South Asian diaspora, the increasing recognition and celebration of Hindi films in Western cultural spaces, and the emergence of new global markets for Hindi cinema. However, what underlies these processes is a less explored dimension. Hindi filmmakers' own drive for distinction and greater social acceptance, which is the focus of my book. Amitabh Bachchan's statements at Davos about how cinema was not regarded as a promising profession in India, and that, quote, children from good homes were not encouraged to go anywhere near it, articulates the peculiar sense of social marginality members of the Hindi film industry have felt over the years. Despite the fact that Bachchan's own social class, family background, and level of education marks him as someone from, quote, a good home, in his remarks we encounter the disdain that filmmakers perceive is directed toward them by those from good homes and good families. In spite of their fame and fortune, I found that Hindi filmmakers were extremely concerned with appearing, quote, respectable. And I examined how this idea is understood, expressed, and enacted within the industry. One dimension of this concern for respectability was that members of the industry really seemed to valorize higher education, which helped me, gain, helped me to gain access to stars, directors, producers, and other people of power within the industry. During my fieldwork, I was able to meet a large number of people because I was carrying out academic research and receiving a PhD for ostensibly studying about films and filmmakers. People always asked in a slightly incredulous tone, you mean you can get a PhD in this, you know, in America? Like they really thought like, I kept saying I'm not getting a PhD in the film industry, it's like really, I'm getting it in anthropology, but you know, people, I could just see in their minds were like, wow, you can do anything with it, can't you, right? So it was like people were like really kind of, couldn't quite understand what I was doing. Uh, but even though they were incredulous about it, for a form of popular culture that had always been criticized as vulgar and lowbrow by the English language press and English speaking elites, and for a social group whose dominant image was that of being uncouth, uneducated, and unintelligent, being the object of study by an academic researcher granted the cultural legitimacy and a higher social status created by many filmmakers. Many people told me the reason they were granting me interviews was because I was writing a thesis or a book for academic rather than journalistic motivation. So I discuss the valorization of formal education in the book, which sheds further light on why a 20-something graduate student in anthropology from New York was able to meet some of the biggest celebrities in India, even in the world. Now, the increased cultural legitimacy of popular Hindi cinema is a result of what I argue was a process of gentrification of Hindi cinema and the Hindi film industry. Now, gentrification, which in its most basic definition means to renovate or convert an area to conform to middle class taste is an 
Being an apt metaphor to describe the changes that occurred in the Hindi film industry during the late 1990s and early 2000s. Since the industry had been concerned with respectability and middle class acceptance since the 1930s, conventional accounts of popular Hindi cinema had described it as a cultural form concerned with mass appeal and representing the sensibilities of the slum. This was Ashish Nandi's famous argument. Um, despite the close identification on the part of scholars and journalists between Hindi cinema and the working poor or quote masses of Indian society, what I had observed during a decade of fieldwork from 96 to 2006 was that members of the Hindi film industry consistently distanced themselves from such audiences and identified with and sought acceptance, approval, and respect from more elite segments of Indian society. One of the more unexpected findings of my fieldwork was the inordinate amount of paternalism and condescension expressed toward audiences, specifically the masses, the most common label for poor and working class audiences, who until the early 2000s were understood to comprise the bulk of the film viewing audience. For years in media, state, and scholarly discussions, the masses were posited as the root cause of Hindi cinema's narrative, thematic, and aesthetic deficiencies and I discovered that the majority of filmmakers I met professed similar views. I mean, that was something that I was quite shocked by, actually. Like, most people had a very, um, they were very, very uh, condescending and pejorative about the very bulk of people who were actually kind of making the industry thrive, in one sense. I characterized this desire for respectability and elite approval as the Hindi film industry's drive to gentrify itself, its audiences, and its film culture. Just as urban gentrification is marked by vocabulary of progress, renovation, and beautification, which is based upon increasing social inequality through uh, dis displacing poor and working class residents from urban centers, the gentrification of Indian cinema was also articulated through a discourse of quality, improvement, and innovation that was often linked to the displacement of the poor and working classes from the spaces of production and consumption. So according to industry and media commentators, right, so this is the dominant kind of representation that's happening. This is, so this is me talking about the representation. So according to industry and media commentators, a more educated and socially elite class of people working in filmmaking has led the industry to become more respectable and produce a better caliber of films. These better films are being watched by superior class of audiences, more commonly referred to as the classes or the gentry in industry who are more amenable to experimentation and variety in cinema. Therefore, according to the industry, elite producers and audiences engender better cinema. So this is, was a dominant kind of discourse and narrative that I encountered. The results of this gentrification were evident in three main ways. First, from the mid-90s to the mid-2000s in the films themselves. There was a growing concern with wealthy protagonists and the near-complete erasure of the working class, urban poor, and rural dwellers who were once prominent as protagonists hero, and heroes in Hindi films. When films focused on non-elites, they still represented an elitist perspective in that the protagonists were frequently depicted as gangsters or as part of some criminal environment, rather than being the unmarked everyman protagonist of earlier eras of Hindi cinema. Additionally, more and more films were shot in North America, the UK, Australia, and Europe rather than in India, so that India itself was increasingly erased from the films. Secondly, the film industry had become progressively more insular and exclusionary, so that it was very difficult for people without any family or social connections to get a break into the top tier of the industry. Finally, in the sites of circulation and exhibition, a new geography of distribution emerged which valued metropolitan and overseas markets and marginalized equally populous for provincial markets. Furthermore, the development of multiplexes since the mid-2000s has been transforming cinema and going into an elite pastime. My discussion and explanation of these processes are based upon over a decade of fieldwork, as well as filmmaker statements and reflections about films and filmmaking over that period, rather than an in-depth analysis of the films. So these processes of gentrification address and attempt to resolve the dilemmas posed by what I would argue as one of the central features of the production culture of the Hindi film industry, which is the immense disdain that filmmakers themselves express for the industry and for their audiences. So the disdain is the one overriding sentiment that I found was kind of helping to characterize or shape everything else that was happening within the industry. So one of the more unexpected findings of my fieldwork was how frequently Hindi filmmakers criticized the industry's work culture, production practices, and quality of filmmaking. 
I was also surprised by the inordinate amount of paternalism and condescension expressed toward audiences. The masses, right? Um, and the book, so that's, just, so that's talking about the disdain. And so generally, just to kind of give an overview of the book, the book is comprised of nine chapters that detail the production culture of the Hindi film industry, focusing on filmmakers' drive for social distinction and efforts to ma manage un the uncertainty of filmmaking which have contributed to the gentrification of the film industry and Hindi cinema, which then kind of allows this entity of Bollywood to emerge. The chapters are organized along three main themes, the social status of films and filmmakers, the social material practices of filmmaking, and the social material and discursive practices of audience making. So the first three chapters establish the wider and social historical context of Hindi filmmaking, dealing explicitly with the issues of cultural legitimacy and social respectability connected to the the world of filmmakers, as well as the kind of political and historical uh, field of film production. So including, um, you know, how the Indian government has viewed filmmaking over a large, kind of a long historical period, all the way from actually the nationalist time, like pre-independence, to, um, to the kind of, to, a, to industry status. So there's like a kind of a long discussion of changing state attitudes toward filmmaking. Um, chapters Kind of the middle part of the book, chapters four through seven, uh, address the practices of film production and filmmakers' efforts to make sense of and manage uncertainty. So that actually has a lot about how people, how the industry actually functions, the daily work culture, how it's organized, um, the coming of kind of corporate entities. What does that mean? How they manage risk? How they think about uncertainty? Um, so that's kind of a big chunk of the middle. And then the last chunk of the book, which is two chapters, are really about how the film industry thinks about its audiences, how they imagine their audiences, and how the audiences get classified, as well as uh, changing, changing ideas about what's necessary for a film to become a hit, and also a changing value about the notion of a universal hit. Right? And so also ideas about the nichification of audiences as well, with the coming of multiplexes. So it's kind of a comprehensive overview of all the kinds of changes that have happened um, over a long period of time. So what I just want to do quickly, kind of in the remaining, um, in the time remaining, I just want to read a little bit of the beginning of chapter two, which is entitled From Slum Dogs to Millionaires, The Gentrification of Hindi Cinema. So that's actually about the narrative of changes, the, about the narratives of change that occur in Hindi cinema and filmmaking in, uh, from the mid-90s. And this chapter kind of identifies this, what I call the sentiment of disdain that kind of permeates the industry's production culture. So the chapter actually focuses on the idea of progress that filmmakers have, but it's usually, I mean, they don't call it progress, it's actually articulated through the idea of coolness. So the notion of like films have become cool now, or Hindi, film or Hindi films are cool. So that notion of coolness, what does it actually mean? Um, so I'm trying to talk, kind of unpack this idea of cool and um, kind of focusing on how that idea of cool is based on actually both changes in the films themselves, but also connected to filmmakers' own sense of themselves vis-a-vis -vis their audiences. And it's also connected to changing technology. So like the cha you know, so the arrival of video, to the arrival of satellite, to the arrival of multiplexes. So cool is actually this really interesting category, which is both about films, about filmmakers, as well as about technology. Um, so that's kind of, I just want to read a little bit of that. And I'm going to stop this because it's I think, getting distracting. But actually, um, I have, I can um, quickly run through this once I read this little excerpt. Can you just ask a question? Yes, sure. In your study and research, did you ever get a chance to try how uh, the different dimensions of film distribution, filmmaking, and uh, Film markets subsequent to retirement uh, are the dimensions taken care of as uh, one organization or a set of organizations. You mean in terms of what? Production, distribution, and artists' retirement, and after retirement, their life um, security. Yeah, no, that's a really great question. I didn't. I definitely have a lot of discussion of distribution. Um, there's an entire chapter about distribution and how that's what the changes that have happened. What you're talking about in terms of um, the issue of especially the workers and the kind of the labor of the industry, 
that is not in this book. Um, this is really a book about the people who are in power in the industry. So it's about the stars, the producers, the directors, the financiers, distributors, exhibitors, the whole other world of like what I call the life, I mean the life one, like how, you know, that unfortunately, I mean, I'm one for, you know, that's something that I, I encountered but I didn't address. Um, but having said that, I was just at, on, today's Friday, uh, on um, Wednesday, I was actually at a conference, There's, there was a three-day conference in Bombay at Maralad about the All India Film Employees Confederation, which is actually talking about, so all the different federations all over India of the main filmmaking states, uh, which are, and dealing with, you know, it's the cameramen, the lightmen, the dancer, all of these new trade unions got together and they have a conference every four years. So I actually got to attend that and got to uh, hear about the kinds of con working conditions. And, you know, so I, got, I, mean, I mean, that's a huge topic, but unfortunately I didn't get a chance to. But I could see, though, it's a very, um, I mean, I saw accidents in front of me. And I've encountered people having to plead with producers for um, medical help and financial help when they've had accidents. I mean, it's a very, given the star-centric nature of the industry, so much of the resources get diverted to the stars that there isn't, I think what you're alluding to is like there isn't, there isn't kind of established security for people, like you know, a type of social welfare net for workers. Although all of these trade unions are keep trying for that, you know. So that's what I heard a lot this week. They were talking about uh, their demands and what they're doing, and you know, and a lot of focus on medical attention and like trying to raise money for those schemes. Um, so they're they're all. I mean, that's a huge problem, and they're trying for that. And I think it's the way that the industry, the economics of the industry, is organized. It says that so much of the money. So it's very kind of lopsided in terms of how the money circulates. It's so driven towards so the top. Talking for I do, or someone else can be doing this. Yeah, yeah, that's a huge topic. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. But it's something that unfortunately I wasn't able to. Yeah. Yeah. The people who are at the you know the center of power, the stars, the directors, the cameramen. Life after films. Yeah. Is it a part of the book? No, not life after. No, life after films did not did not make it to be a part of the book um, because it was really about the life of filmmaking, right? Um, so no, unfortunately, it, it wasn't. There's only there's only so much one person can do. But these are all interesting. I mean, these are all interesting avenues for other people to explore, or maybe I don't know, myself to explore. I don't know, I'm something that I come from the industry. That's what I want. Because I come from a handsome job on the industry. So that's my anxiety, and that's what I'm writing about. Next one, then. So just a little bit from Slum Dogs to Millionaires. So it starts with a quote With the multiplexes, seeing a movie has become an elite affair. In December 2005, I was standing in the Soho branch of Chanel with Asha Mehta. Oh, these are all pseudonyms. You won't be able to grab in this case. Um, I was standing in the Soho branch of Chanel with Asha Mehta, a Hindi film actress who was visiting New York City with her boyfriend, director Tarun Kumar, whom I had known since 19, 1996. The three of us had met for lunch nearby and were strolling through the neighborhood when Mehta spotted the Chanel store and decided to check out their handbags. While Kumar was paying for the purchase, a, price with, a purse with a price tag greater than my monthly rent, Mehta was discussing what she felt was a drastic change in the social status of Hindi cinema. Before, the elite didn't watch, or they said they didn't watch even if they did, because they looked down upon it. But now, Hindi movies are stylish and cool. Bollywood is everywhere, even in the discos." End quote. Over the years, I've been hearing some variation of Mehta's assertion that Hindi films have become cool from a number of people associated with the Bombay film industry. During my first stint of Fieldwork in 96, when I interviewed Pablo Samaya, the editor of G, a glossy, she's not around anymore, so yeah, no. so those of you may remember, but those of you don't know, a glossy English language film magazine, she related how her teenage nieces had informed her, quote, by the way, Hindi film is in now, it was out earlier. 
In 2006, during my last research trip to Bombay, Shravan Shah, uh, the 30-something CEO of Fame Cinemas, back then, which is now also no longer, uh, asserted during our interview, quote, I think Hindi films are very cool now. While Nestor D'Souza, the manager of the erstwhile Metro Cinema, declared, quote, it's no longer uncool to be seen in Hindi film. Implicit in the deployment of cool as a category is its opposite or other, a period when such a desired status for Hindi films had not been achieved, as Schroff elaborated upon in his assertion, quote, earlier it used to be uncool to see Hindi movies. During my school days, when I had to tell somebody that my father had something to do with the film industry, I couldn't say it because people thought it was really stupid. How can you have anything to do with the Indian film industry? And we guys grew up on Hollywood films and Asian films like Top Gun, well, end quote. By stating that he grew up with Hollywood films, Schrock indirectly communicated his elite class position since the circulation and presence of such films prior to the mid-1990s was very limited in India. Additionally, India is one of the few countries that in the world where locally produced content is predominant. Even with the greater presence of Hollywood films, foreign content comprises only about 5 to 10 percent of total screen time. Despite being the third generation of his family to be involved with the business side of filmmaking, Schrock's earlier disavowal of Hindi films and filmmaking positions him within a very specific and circumscribed class fragment of Indian society, the elite who, according to Mantha, looked down upon Hindi cinema. The present for Shroff is marked not by shame and repudiation, however, but by pride and acceptance, which he attributes to the improved quality of films. So this is a long quote by Shroff. Quote, I think the kids today ape Shah Rukh Khan and Saif Ali Khan, and I think it's really cool to be associated with Indian films. And the quality of Indian films has gone through the roof. So today, you know, I have no qualms in admitting to the world that I work in the Indian film industry. I think it's really cool because people look up to it and say, wow, that's such a fantastic job. You know, 20 years back when I was in school, people used to snigger and I used to feel really foolish telling people that my father has something to do with the Indian film industry, so it's been a total change, end quote. Not only do Shroff statements represent the disdain that Hindi filmmakers have historically expressed toward their own practice, but they also reveal the tremendous concern for acceptance by individuals who filmmakers regard as their social peers, but not as their typical audience. Schroff's allusion to the kids today who ate leading actor Shah Rukh Khan and Saif Ali Khan is not a comment about the newfound popularity of Hindi film stars who have always commanded tremendous fan followings, but about the popularity of such stars among a small social fraction who, from Schroff's perspective, would never have been fans during his youth. Thus, from the perspective of the Hindi film industry, cool is an attribute that includes films, filmmakers, and audiences. When used as an adjective to describe Hindi films, cool signifies a general state of improvement marked by higher production values, as well as a visual style and narrative content that's coded as modern and sophisticated. From Mehta's statements, it's apparent that cool also refers to the open and acknowledged consumption of Hindi films by social elite audiences and to the circulation of these films in spaces marked as upscale. Finally, as apparent from Schroff's remarks, cool denotes a self-confidence among filmmakers where they're not embarrassed or apologetic about filmmaking. So they can do make films like him and Bala nowadays. Um, therefore, cool is a policy in the category right, that encompasses aesthetics, affect, social class, identity, and subjectivity. So in this chapter, I examine the film industry's discourses of quality and change, indexed by such declarations of Hindi films' newfound coolness in order to illustrate the connections between disdain, coolness, and the process of gentrification, as well as um, filmmakers' own kind of construction of their, their identities and their selves. Hindi cinema's social transformation, or path to coolness, often kind of celebrated by filmmakers and journalists, began in the mid-1990s with the erasure of the signs and symbols of poverty, labor, and rural life from films, and with the decline in plots that focused on class conflict, social injustice, and youthful rebellion. While journalists, filmmakers, and scholars attribute these, these changes uh, that I label as gentrification to changes in audience demographics, right? everyone kind of blamed those of us who live you know, abroad for all these changes, the vast one. Um, I actually argue that filmmakers' own um, subjectivities, generational status, and class backgrounds play an important role in these transformations. Filmmakers' explanations for the aesthetic qualities of mainstream the cinema and their narratives of change and progress actually display a lot of concern about social status, cultural identity, and, and modernity. And so little, just because it's, I'm quite struck by this phenomenon that we have, and this kind of nostalgia that first started for the 70s and now has 
gone into the 80s, because I just want to read you a little bit, because uh, you know, well, this, I'm quite struck by this, this uh, building here, the, the turn to the nostalgia of the 80s. Okay. Because, there's a sub, so there's a section in my chapter called The Antithesis of Pool, a.k.a. the 80s, the era of video and trashy cinema. So during many of my conversations and interviews with filmmakers, the 1980s emerged as a particularly dreadful period of filmmaking, in contrast with both earlier and later periods of movie cinema. Ahmed Khan asserted vociferously, quote, the 80s, I believe, was the worst period of Indian cinema. The number of films which were trashy were unbelievable, and I, as an audience was, you know, really shocked. He related that as a teenager watching films during this period, he was extremely disappointed by the kind of films being made, made, which he described as horrible. When I asked him what was horrible about the films, he explained, what was not horrible? That would be easy to answer. They didn't have good stories, they didn't have good music, they didn't have good lyrics, the performances were loud, and the scenes were horrible, and nothing was nice about them. They were just trashy. The right word for them is trashy. Ridiculous films were being made. Very few of them were nice, really count the number of films in the year which were decent and you, and you know worthy of viewing. And that also reflected in the box office collections because the collections started dropping, end quote. Other filmmakers mentioned cliché plots and dialogues, excessive violence, garish sets, and vulgar choreography as further illustrations of the decline in cinematic quality by the mid to late 1980s. Zaran Johar attributed the degeneration in filmmaking to the general social malaise of the decade where in his words, quote, nothing happened in either in society or in politics. George's comments were made to a group of NYU faculty, including me, and graduate students who had the opportunity to visit his film shoot in Sleepy Hollow, New York, in November 2005. This is when he was shooting for Gabriel So he continued by asserting that kitsch did not exist in Bollywood until the South Indian invasion. During the 1980s, when, quote, everybody was dancing in pots, pans, utensils, and suddenly hundreds of dancers were dancing behind the main yeah. <laughs> What Johar was referring to was a phase in the Bombay film industry starting in 1983 when a number of Hindi films were produced and directed by filmmakers from the Telugu Tamil film industries, most uh, frequently starring the southern actresses, uh, Sri Devi and Jayaprada, with the Bombay Strategy film. These films exhibited a style of choreography that was frequently derided by the press at the time as calisthenics and a visual style described as kitschy. During my fieldwork in 1996, I encountered a curious ambivalence among Hindi filmmakers regarding the southern film industries. While the Telugu and Tamil film industries were often described as more efficient, disciplined, and organized in the Bombay industry, and certain actors, directors, and technicians were held in highest regard, lauded as innovative pathbreakers, like someone like the uh, The overall characterization of South Indian cinema, usually just referred to as the South cinema rather than the um, was not very flattering. Everything was described as more excessive than in Hindi films. The visual style more garish, the women heavier set, the humor cruder, and the drama louder. The dominant explanation for the horrible 80s had less to do with the influence of South Indian cinema, however, and more to do with the introduction of video, video cassette technology, and its associated problems of video piracy and changes in patterns of film consumption. Um, remember, I mean, again, there's many of you who are very young. So I'd say, I just reminded that VCRs were actually starting to be imported in India in 1982, uh, when the government relaxed import restrictions for VCRs on color TV after a short period before the Asian games. So at the time, about an estimated 1 million uh, color TV sets were imported as a result of the policy change, and then uh, the number of sets in India increased from 5,000 to 5 million in less than two years. While the number of VCRs imported was lower, the impact on the Hindi film industry was noticeable by the fact that references to the video of Menace uh, started appearing in the film trade press by early 1982, actually. So, for example, the trade magazine Film Information in April 1982 reported that at least a thousand hired videos of the film age were circulating long prior to the film's release on April 23rd, um, thereby cutting into the film's potential business. So, um, while the economic impact of video and theatrical exhibition sector is evident, how did the advent of video result in a decline in cinematic standards, or in Khan's words, trashy films? What was it about video that engendered poor filmmaking? It's in this realm of explanation where the discussion of cinematic quality actually becomes a discussion about audiences, and a commentary on class, and the trashy 80s actually span a period from about 1985 to 1994. 
filmmakers and English language press and like art uh, magazines like the Good Today, um, Frontline, and the Labor Outlook, they laid the blame squarely on the changing class composition of audiences frequented theaters. Um, I think I'm just going to stop there. Just go on. But um, I, what I want to just do then quickly um, is just to, you know, again, some of you look very young, so you may not even, like, you may think that in the 90s was a long time back. Um, quickly, just taking some of <laughs> images. Um, I still sometimes forget that we're in our second decade of the millennium. But um, just to remind us, what Hindi films are about, um, you know, in terms of like the main characters. So I'm just going to take us to a quick little trip down memory lane, uh, right? So you know, what, what were our icon? You know, what were our heroes like, right? Uh, who did they represent? So you know, here's Raj Kapoor, right, as the migrant to Bombay in Jar Salis. Here's Amitabh Bachchan, right, as Vijay, the dock worker in Dubai. And then, just to connect you, you know, like if you look at the kind of uh, visual culture of the films, you know, if you look at these posters and you can see, you know, what they're like um, in terms of how they're representing um, the the actors and just kind of the whole look of it, um, you know, you can see, I mean, the kind of the, the centrality of a certain kind of masculine hero. I mean, in this, obviously, I mean, you know, like, in the, in, you know, especially Amitabh Bachchan's character, right, the iconic angry young man, fighting uh, for justice in various forms, it continues into the 80s. And then we have, right, Shah Rukh Khan is the NRI, and then, and these are a whole slew of films, right, that come about in the 90s, which are, I mean, just a marked difference in, in the kind of visual style, and also the kind of image of the hero. And I just want to play a couple of clips, so again, again, see the transformation and the themes, too. Directly or unheavy, in the past, you can't even hear the
isn't that quite, you know, like the social critique, obviously, in Jasmine's, and here also, right, um, you know, he, I, those of you who've seen Tushul, you know the story, I mean, he's an illegitimate son, um, the kind of anger, and, um, and, you know, and his father, of course, is a wealthy builder, right? Um, but then, just, you know, maybe it's almost unfair, the juxtaposition, but it is what it is. Um, <laughs> but, you know, this is the film that made, hold on, sorry.
So, and also I'm just amazed that like there's so few people around sometimes. Um, yeah, I just want to show you this is all familiar. But just uh, here, just to get a sense of the, of the contrast in terms of ticket rates. And I hear now, of course, all the films. Huh? Yeah, I mean, like the film, the tickets go up and up. And of course, um, as I was mentioning to um, Alanti and Diana, that, um, you know, in all these discussions about 200 floors, 100 floors, 200 floors, 200 floors, no one actually talks about um, how many tickets are sold. You just talk about the revenue. And so, you know, if you jack up your prices to like 800 or 700, I'm sure you can generate that. We don't actually know, like, how many people are watching the You know that a lot of money is made, but, you know, you can, if you, you can make a lot of money from fewer number of tickets if those tickets are priced really astron you know, astronomically high. So um, I always take those figures, I, I would always take all those figures with a huge grain of salt. Um, I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Um, it's a really long book, and you know, it's like there's no way, there's no uh, kind of end that I could actually um, kind of end on. I just wanted to kind of give you a little taste of it. So I'm happy to take any questions. We've seen that in the past 20 years or so, uh, particularly post-95, there has been a, a shift from rural to urban to elite and even international global audiences. And the content reflects this change. In the process, what's happening to rural audiences? What are they watching? Or are they forced to watch what uh, urban audiences are watching? That's a great question. And I want, one thing that I want to really specify is that, you know, we often hear this term rural audience and filmmakers and the film industry and the media talk about that, but actually cinema going is an urban habit. So if you actually look at the distribution of movie theaters in, in India, um, you don't have movie theaters in the rural areas. I mean, you have traveling cinemas, but those two can be few and far between. It is really an urban habit. So when you're talking about the kind of distribution of cinema, like there used to be a whole gradation of A, B, and C class centers, which really has to do with their revenue earning potential and how big a trend is. So, so cinemas have never been in like a rural context. I mean, you can have them in the small town, sometimes what they call the move vessels, right? So, um, so, and it's shocking how the, the number of movie theaters in India, how it's shocking how low they are. They're actually only about and again, this is a, another thing that's hard to find. It's like hard to find, people People aren't even counting how many movie theaters there are, but like I had to work really hard to figure out how it was going through various Ministry of Statistics documents. Um, I mean, I have it, the specific, I have the exact number in the book, but it's something like only about 8,000 movie theaters in the entire country. And most of them are actually in the South. Exactly. So for Hindi, sorry? Exactly the number of but see what has happened? is that because they used to have the 12,000, they used to do 12,000 screens, 12,000 movie theaters, but that was in a single screen day. But now with multiplexes actually, um, you can't have that statistic anymore, which is still like gets thrown out. So you have to figure out, so I've actually figured out how many screens, again, I, it's in the book, but um, because the actual number of multiplex screens, again, is something they say about, um, it's something like a thousand or something, you know, it's like, it's actually quite minuscule given how large the country is. So, so if we're going to talk about the breakdown of the population, if we're saying like 25, is, what is it, 25% urban to 75% rural, then mo most of the country is actually not watching films, right? So it's, um, I don't know, I mean, so, but the, but the, it's a, but the idea of a rural audience is a trope that's in filmmakers' imaginations, and they use that term all the time, and actually, and I talk about it in the book where people have, like, filmmakers have said, well, you know, the films that those people like, you know, they don't actually help us. I mean, they're not the kind of things that make us proud, right? So there's also a real disdain towards it. And again, what is it based on? It's based on nothing, I'm sorry. Like, I'd be as blunt as saying that, like, filmmakers really don't know their audiences. They kind of make up 
they imagine their audiences in all kinds of fantastic ways, which is not based on any kind of reality. But at the same time, that's what the film that's that's part of the dilemma of any kind of media making because you don't know your audience. You know, you make something and you kind of like and you, there's no feedback loop. It's even the idea of the box office is a very imperfect feedback mechanism because there's all kinds of ways that what they think is happening in the box office is can it can get manipulated, massaged in all kinds of ways, right? So there's it's a very imperfect mechanism for understanding what someone likes. So in the end of the day, filmmakers really don't know what people like. Um, even audiences, I could say, we, we don't know what we like until we see it, right? And then after, then it's like so everything's like post fact analysis, right? So when people say rural audiences like this or don't like this, it's like, well, how do you know? And one, there's no rural audience, but the kind of semi-urban. How do you know that? Well, this film did well. There's a lot of like the idea of a film doing well and hence giving us an insight into what people like is also really problematic because what counts as doing well in the industry is when the trade within the trade is when the distributor makes profit. And when the distributor makes profit it can actually be separate from the issue of the whole audience because a distributor makes profit based on how much it's how much money he's bid for the film. So if he bid a low figure and he bought the film at a low price, he's making a profit, right? You didn't necessarily have to have a lot of people seeing the film. Alternately, if he bought the film at a really high price, he he may not. He actually has less chance of making a profit. And since you could have tons of people watching that film, but the distributor didn't make a profit, then it's considered a flop. So you're like the hit and flop is actually a bit, the way the hit and flop gets calculated within within uh, within filmmaking in India because the ticket prices are completely elastic, right? You can have 800 rupee tickets or you know whatever 100 rupee tickets. Uh, because the prices are so elastic, it's actually re it's really hard to um, use the revenue or the idea of a hit and flop to kind of say, aha, this is what you know this is what people want. It's actually a completely imperfect mechanism. And I think everywhere it's imperfect because in the end of the day you bought a ticket. What if you hated the film? But once you bought that ticket, the film industry registers it as approval, right? You bought that ticket, so it's like, oh yeah, it's got tell it. But you could have totally hated it. Right? And after that, too bad. It's like counted as approval. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay, uh, let me uh, uh, an extension of my, my first question about what happens to rural audiences. Keeping rural audiences out of this Discussion uh, based on what you just sure. shared with us. What happens to the you know the bottom end of urban audiences? I mean, sure. uh, what happens to audiences in places like say Sholapur or Karad or even Aliba? Mm -hmm. uh, do they enjoy the Karanjohar movies or are they looking for something different? No, it's a great question. Um, I don't have the answer to that question because um, I because I haven't done that kind of research with audiences, right? Uh, but having said that, I feel like there's a, a one of the things I, I really emphasize in the book is that the kind of, you know, there's a lot of, I mean, people kind of talk about we're at a time in filmmaking where there's a lot more, there seems to be a lot more experimentation, that, that there's like d definitely different kind of voices coming out. And I won't deny that, right? And, and different voices are coming out because they're also able to, you have more, possibilities for exhibition, you know, and there's like certain things that change with an exhibition distribution that allow people who are not so concerned having a very kind of conventional mainstream film, they're still able to perhaps make their film. Now, having said that, one shouldn't assume just because those things are out there that somehow that, oh, what does that mean for the bichara, you know, like these are not films, you know, like why should we assume that the unconventional film is something that, you know, like a person in Sholapur doesn't want to see, right? The distributor may assume that, the producer may assume that. I would say it kind of as a scholar, as an analyst, like I would be very careful. I would not want to make that leap because that's a huge assumption, right? Because that assumption is based on what? It's based on a certain stereotype, a certain categorization that the media and film industry is happily indulging in. But I would kind of step back and like, you know, I don't know what that. And because why is it because you live in a certain place that mark you to be in a certain way, right? I think people infinitely are much more, I think humans are much more complicated in their relationship to media. And I would never want to kind of, with a large brush, say because someone lives in Muradabad or Bijnod, like 
husbands from Western Newby. Lived in these, like, you know, whatever. There's definitely another, I think all the places, you know, that somehow, like, they only will have this one particular taste in film. The film industry definitely thinks that. I don't think that. I think that. There have been some interesting experiments, like ones like here and then there, where, um, say, a ship of Theseus, for example, they counted that and they got it released in, like, I think some 50 or 60 cities yes. doing really well all across. But, but that is also okay. because, uh, sorry, hi, uh, my question and my answer. So I just want to have you raise a point. Um, I've worked with Yashash Films and I have a certain answer to that. There was a film called E. Zara which was launched. And uh, initially people thought it was a fantastic hit and people loved it. But the truth was that the film did well in rural areas. And the shows were at 6 o'clock in the morning because the mill workers who worked late in the night, actually they made the film hit. Not us, the urban guys who paid 300 bucks. Because we went and saw the film only once. But the rural audience went and saw it not twice, not thrice, but I think four times. So actually they are people who are there in the audience and we know where to tap it. But we don't get the data. So what you don't get to see or read is the data. Or we are also in the technology where we write it on Facebook or Twitter or, or any other social media and say, oh, this film is not meant for my father or my brother who's staying back in the Zafar Nagar or Bijnor and Blah and stuff like that. So we also are part, uh, part of distribution mechanism in a shadow way by telling our audience and we dividing our own audience. So when a distributor, as you mentioned, regarding Chip of Thesis and the other films, which don't go back, it's, it's because we also write it. So the distributor wants to take it, but we say, oh, you will not enjoy that, you know, it's a little slow film. So that's also another thing. Like film like Gadar, V. Zara, Jappa Gai Jaan, to be uh, very honest, people in urban area trashed it. And, but she said, once you buy a ticket, it's an approval. I counted my money as a producer. But people in smaller pockets really loved it because that Shah Rukh Khan's character was every man in the interior pockets of India, which is true. A guy who's very uh, uh, simple guy is getting a beautiful girl, which happens in a very, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a normal story. It's a very beautiful story if you remember a scene where he keeps a flower and he removes it and keeps it back on the table. So these are very inner uh, gestures which Yash Ji brought in. I'm not being biased. I'm just saying it's true because I worked in it. So I saw the distribution pattern which was happening and I was really surprised by it. There was a film called Laga Chuddi Medav and it was very like, surprising because I remember watching it in Bombay and everybody hated people walked out of the film. Then I went to places like Jabalpur, Indore and lots of India pub and women were crying and women went back to watch it with their husbands, with their children, to say this is what we go through on a daily basis. So it depends on different identification of the character who everybody gets along to it. So I think that's a different uh, so. Sorry, a question to yeah. you. Um, as you said that uh, you've been uh, going on sets and you've been seeing not only in the front of the camera but you've been seeing at the back of the camera. I want you to know what has caught your eye, which department, and why do you think that is an integral part of filmmaking? Um, well, I don't think I could just pinpoint any one department. The thing that I was most struck by is actually um, how flexible, I mean, you know, the thing, the one thing I was struck by is like how everyone complained about how terrible they all were and how disorganized they were, and yet, you know, films are getting made. Yeah, everyone, yeah, everyone complained about every, you know, like everyone complains about someone else. Uh, they, of course, are always fine, right? But the other person is like severely like disorganized. But yet, what I was amazed by actually is the tremendous, and I write about this, the work of the tremendous flexibility and being able to actually, um, you know, have these kinds of decisions by the seat of the pants, you know, like when something happens and can, people can actually like react to it and then, you know, basically that, the Jugaad kind of, you know, so I guess, you know, a lot has been written about India and Jugaad, but I really saw it and what I was also struck by is like how oral everything was when I first started. I mean, like, nothing was written down, and yet, like, um, you know, music was being composed, and, um, you know, like, just all kinds of things were happening, um, and, like, the dubbing, you know, it's like the guy's dubbing, and the assistant director's listening, and it's all based on, like, well, I know this is how the dialogue should be correct, and you need to, you know, uh, you need to correct it. 
the, the oral, orality of everything was like quite striking to me because you know, um, and that's also again of course critic self criticism that's another point of self criticism. But I, you know, because as an outsider, I found it fascinating because what it meant was that there were certain certain faculties that are highly developed, which is the memory faculties and incredibly developed. The fact that like most people were not storyboarding, and yet you know, I mean, the fact. You know, you see how they work, and then you see what comes on screen, and it's quite remarkable. And also, um, the resourcefulness. Like, you don't need a huge fog machine. You have that guy walking with the loban, you know, and like the fog is being clear. And also, like, really, really, um, you know, very. Uh, and I've seen things. I saw them when they were working in the U.S. And I've seen things. I live in New York. I see film shoots all around me, and there's like Hazar like light stands and like fanny trucks for like one shot, you know, like the, Amer the way the Americans work, it's like, why do you need this much stuff? You don't need any of this stuff, you know, like for two actors to do a, you know, conversation on like the corner of New York, they, the entire, like this, you know, the whole like 10 block radius is like filled with like saman and like people and like, and, and I've seen like huge, you know, so I remember one of the shoots where um, in Philly, these guys come, they're like, they needed a clothes, you know, it's like, oh, we need a tree, a chawa, hape ne, a chati ke wo leao, you know, thoda sa ek wo patte leao, us pair se, you put it in front of the hero heroine, it's an extreme close-up anyway, pair ke uche, bas ut wo hai laga, you know, so like, I, they're actually kind of, the resourcefulness was actually very impressive, which they never, I mean, I would say, you, you're very flexible, and the, my filmmaker, my director, was like, you say flexible, I say disorganized. I'm like, well, it just really depends on, you know. But from my point of view, I was quite amazed at how um, things got done. And also, like, a real, like, I mean, nothing got wasted, right? Um, I mean, so that, so I was actually quite impressed with how a lot of things got done. I mean, then, of course, other things, you know, whatever. But, um, you know, there are other things that, like, don't get done as well uh, or as efficiently. But so, I mean, I wouldn't say, um, any one department, but especially on the set, I mean, like, things are, I mean, like, yeah, like, why does it take forever to light the set, and, you know, whatever, the first shot sometimes can take hours, but, um, but you know, but other, other things were, like, quite amazingly, amazingly efficient, even though they don't think of themselves as efficient, you know, but it's also depends on, you know, but it's, I think, actually, when they come to the U.S., they're remarkably efficient, they get things done, like, they would call pack up, like, they had an eight-hour shift, they call, call pack up in four hours, they got their work done, I think it's because no one is coming on set and, like, Bugging them. You know, that's what happens. You're like, people are going and coming and that's why income tax is not going to be a photo. You know, like, what you're doing. But like, New York is going to be a photo. If you're working in natural light, you don't, have to light, you don't have to light the set. So, you know, they can be actually remarkably efficient. So that's quite something um, quite interesting. I mean, that's something else. Yeah. Hi, uh, as you said, the whole Bollywood industry is quite top heavy. The actors, mm -hmm. directors, mean, yeah. yeah, they get all the. So there are many mm -hmm. gaps in this market of whole Bollywood. For example, casting is a gap which got filled only very recently. So, what are the gaps which got filled in the last 15 20 years, and what are the gaps which are still remaining? And the hindrance is so much that they're not being filled in the next uh, few years. When you say gaps, you mean like, when you say gaps in casting, you mean like certain professional. Yeah, uh, exactly. Like so, there were no casting directors. There were no casting directors. Ago. Like what are the other ones that yeah. you think? I, I think um, one field and which has to remain. Uh, goodness, let's see. I think definitely um, a lot more emphasis needs to, or and respect and kind of like having to ramp up the status of writers. I think writers are still in like screenwriting and script scriptwriters. I think that that's a kind of specialization that. Um, still doesn't get taken seriously. And I think because the way films get, you know, most scripts get written for a star, right? I mean, the whole process of how a film gets kind of on board, um, I think that's, you know, where it's like if you don't have a star on board, then, you know, the script isn't going to bit or you don't, can't even bother writing. You know, the whole notion of um, writing on spec, the idea like you, you write a script, um, you hope it's good, then you kind of shop it around and hope that it gets made. You know, that kind of, that doesn't happen here so much. I mean, or you, because then you waste your time because you can't get someone on video. So I feel like that is a, I think that's a part that, um, and I have many uh, friends in the industry or writers, and that's what they really um, 
are very vexed about it. And I think the idea that, um, and I think there's so much more s d scope to be had with adaptation. You know, like there's, I mean, I feel like that that focus on trying to diversify content and having um, pathways to do that. I think that's something that I think should. De I think there's much more that can be done, right? Like. Um, the idea of optioning, you know, optioning a story, you know, like there's a whole, really focusing on how you can um, have some kind of infrastructure to develop content, right? Develop like the script um, and pay more attention and have more attention paid to that. I would, I would say that's something that definitely, I think more. I think I'm sure more people want to have happen. Yeah. So. What is your take on the political misplacement of characters and narratives, especially in terms of gender? So we all know of the whole item numbers thing, but I'd rather talk from the point of view of a Devanand's gentleman to a Prabhu Deva directed perverse hero who is so blatantly like mass yeah, he's very violent and so what is it taken on that? Is it like a deliberate effort on a producer's part or is it an organic thing that has come to you? You mean the, like... That, that the whole character thing becoming very politically incorrect. Just, and yeah. from their point of view it would be to gain mass market appeal, but... Would be I mean, most of these, I mean... But if you're saying there's no mass, then yeah, I mean, are they yeah. doing this for... I think they are... Well, no, here's the thing, all these films that you're talking about, they're all, weren't they all huge hits in a different language? I mean, these are all remakes of Tamil and Telugu films. So one of the easiest ways to kind of hedge your bets and manage risk is to make, do a remake of something that has already worked somewhere else, you know? And so that, so this is, um, I mean, I would say this is like really more about a risk, like managing risk and managing uncertainty. Like, this is a strategy. So that all of these films, I mean, that all of these, uh, films that I imagine you're alluding to are like actually remakes of Tamil Telugu films. Now, why are they do it? So, well, man, they made a lot of money, so you know why? I mean, you know, like why not? Why not try? It worked with one set of audiences. Maybe it'll work with this set of audiences, right? Because and I mean, because filmmaking is always about trying to manage risk, right? Um, so I would say that, and you know, I. Um, I tend to refrain, I mean, I have my own particular, like, personal taste and like, what I like and don't like, but, um, you know, this kind of narrative, like, oh, everything is, like, terrible now, I mean, I would, I don't like, I don't subscribe to a kind of, like, it's all awful, right, or, like, it's always, I don't just, uh, subscribe to this kind of overall narrative of, like, decline. Um, sometimes we have a lot of nostalgia. You see some films in the past. They were awful. Like you see some films from the fifties. I mean, I'm sorry. Like those like heroines were awful. The heroes were awful. And they all. It was like pretty really bad. You know, we just remember the good ones, right? You know, this is the thing. When you think about the past, the past is already kind of nicely like organized in our head, right? And like sanitized. And so we only remember like Avada or you know like Biasa, you know. But like they were made. I mean, you know, even back in the fifties, like 80, 100, 120 films were being made out of those hundred films every year. Let's say. How many do we actually remember, right? I mean, so when it talks about the golden age, it's like, you know, we're always talking about like 30 films, right? What about all the like, you know, 500 others that we don't remember? So I, you know, so I, I, I tend to reserve judgment about that. Because that's that. interesting because I know, and I know your work is not with audiences. So yeah. in that sense, it's not a right question, but your work is with the producers. Yeah. And what he said is in terms of gender attitudes, yeah. working with these producers, yeah. are most of the men anti-women, do they think of women as sex objects, do they think of that, I mean, yeah. or because you said the producers have this idea of sure. being cool, sure, sure, sure. in their minds is it really cool to think of women in this way, like say, uh, like a Ranjana or sure. someone else, see, this is, this is, but this is, you know, this is like this particular moment now, like the kind of moment I'm talking about, like was, those kinds of So was it cool in the, at that time to think of women as just objects or, or did they have liberal worldviews, but they kind of made films that they felt that some imaginary mass audience. I, would, I feel like both is happening. I mean, you know, one thing I'll say is that, I mean, it's an extremely patriarchal industry in the sense that everything rides on, I mean, like, our films are totally narratively are hero-centric. The film industry is hero-centric, right? I mean, so, you know, and this is how I say, you know, so when, when people wanted, 
want to make a film where the woman is the central character, there's so many things working against that. First, the people say, Are you know, here, let's go opening it. Right, like what's it like, and that I experienced, like listening in conversations, like the difficult, like, and, and yet people are trying to make those films, right? Even like when I was doing film work, people were trying to make films where like the woman was the central protagonist. But the amount of amount of flack or obstacles they had to deal with in terms of their own, like whether it's their peers or then the distributors are saying, you know, that these films don't get an opening, right? So that kind of, and you know, like because again, it's just, again, it's a very funny kind of like. You know, to kind of the mind of the producer, how they imagine the audience is, which is like every there's this kind of very sense of like it's a literal thing. It's like women only want to see women as a central character. I mean, who has determined that? Like, why? Why do they have that idea? I don't. I mean, it makes sense. That, you know, it's like you know, if it, and uh, because by that time, been like what aren't women huge audiences for like all these films as well? In their minds, not. But I, you know, it's just, it's a very kind of um, simplistic understanding of what people want to see in a film, right? And it's often it's this literal thing. It's like, well, if it's a woman, then the man, the, you know, the men aren't going to... At the one level, you think, like, why wouldn't the men want to go see a woman as a central character? Like, you know, if you're operating in kind of a sexist...